Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and today we continue our Clone Wars series. So far the galaxy has been put into a delicate balancing act. Although the Separatists have a clear advantage in the first year of the war, the Republic has managed to fight back from the precipice of defeat. But at the same time, they can't seem to make any significant progress against the Separatist forces. Just in our last episode, we Count Dooku safely in the captivity of the pirate Hondo Anaka and ready for transfer to the Republic for trial, a series of misfortunate events derailed the whole exchange process, leading to the Count's escape. The Republic is constantly looking for unorthodox methods of keeping the Separatists at bay. This includes targeting high-level officials like Dooku or diplomatic missions like the one Padme took to Rhodia in order to ensure their allegiance to the Republic. But one of the most interesting strategies that was used during the Clone Wars that we see used a lot here on Earth is something known as foreign internal defense. This is where instead of directly attacking a hostile force, a faction will seek potential allies in that region and help them create an opposition force. Depending on the situation in the local region, this opposition force can be strictly political or even turn into a militant group. In this latter case, special training and equipment will be given to this newly created opposition force, and this is usually carried out by special forces. Usually because of the lack of funding and traditional military structure, these groups will be taught to fight as a guerrilla force, causing havoc for enemy factions at a fraction of the cost of a real military invasion. It's a relatively viable tactic and also very cost efficient if carried out in the right method, and the Republic will be looking into it more and more as the war goes on because they clearly are outnumbered by the Separatists and have to think outside the box. Although the case we will be looking at today does not directly involve training of local indigenous forces, the events in this episode will begin paving the way for the Republic to at least inquire about using foreign internal defense as a viable option in their war against the Separatist Alliance. Over the world of Quell, Ayala Secure's small task force of Venator-class Star Destroyers is ambushed while still in atmosphere by a larger fleet of Confederate Munificent-class Star Frigates. Now, usually three Venator-class Star Destroyers should be able to handle up to a dozen Munificent-class Star Frigates. But this is only if they can deploy their starfighters in advance to screen and chip away at the enemy forces before they come within visual range. We're not really sure how this battle started, but the fact that it is taking place in atmosphere is quite unusual. The Venator class was atmosphere capable, but a considerable amount of power needed to be devoted to anti-gravity repulsors on the ship in order to keep things afloat, which meant less power was available for the shields and weapons. So it's very likely that the Republic forces did not choose the location of the battle and were simply trying to exit the atmosphere when they were jumped by Separatist forces. Judging from the angle of both ships in this battle, it's very likely that's how the battle happened. And as usual, the high ground is crucial for victory whenever gravity is in play. Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano rush to the Twi'lek Jedi's aid with their own Star Destroyers and find that they are already too late to turn the tide. Most of ILS fleet is already too heavily damaged to escape the planet's gravity well. This battle just became a rescue mission. Using gunships, the Jedi are able to land on ILS command ship but have to fight their way through rocket droids, which are basically super battle droids armed with jetpacks. Highly dangerous. Anakin, being his reckless self, decides to hitch his own ride on one of those rocket droids. With a hectic battle raging within the Venator class Star Destroyer, the droid commander continues firing on the Republic ship, indiscriminately destroying clones and droids. This was kind of one of the advantages that the Separatist leaders had. There was no real moral issue with sending droids through certain death. As a matter of fact, most Separatist commanders were fine with losing dozens of droids just to take out one clone. And if you really look at the numbers, a clone trooper had to kill somewhere around 100 B-1 battle droids to even out the amount of resources both sides spent training and creating these individual units. In the chaos, Anakin Skywalker is severely wounded by an explosion, but the three Jedi and a few clones managed to make it on board one of the cruisers and escape from the Burning Venator class Star Destroyer. Before they can rendezvous with Wolf Yolaran's ship, an explosion sends one of the clones into his control console and it activates the hyperdrive. They're safe for now, but the problem was the jump they had plotted was sending them directly into a star, and on top of that, Anakin was in need of some medical care. For now, the navigation computer seemed to be locked in and broken. Of course, Ayala Sakura knows that whenever a machine gets locked up or frozen, the best way to fix things is flipping the on and off switch, which of course works. Fortunately, they managed to just miss the star and fly out of its gravity well, but they spent just enough time inside the star's gravity well to damage the ship's flight controls, which sends them crashing into a nearby planet known as Meridun.
With their immediate problems solved, now they have to focus on healing Anakin. Ahsoka, of course, is unwilling to leave Anakin behind, even with Rex staying with him to watch over her master. Like Anakin, Ahsoka has a problem with developing personal attachments to people that she likes. Ayla Sakura is there to remind her that her duties are to the Order first. Don't lose a thousand lives just to save one. Ahsoka and Anakin are the type of Jedi that like to save a thousand and one, and that's what really made them special. It's also ironic that Ayala is the one that imparts this lesson to Ahsoka. In Legends, she had a more than intimate relationship with Kit Fisto, which drew ire from the Jedi Council. While Meridun was undoubtedly a beautiful planet, it also was quite dangerous. There were giant predatory birds, which seemed to hunt nocturnally, along with giant seeds that fell from giant trees. The Jedi were more than capable of watching out for themselves, but a few clones in the scouting party are taken out while they're walking through an area of tall grass. Back at camp, Anakin is pretty much useless, and Rex once again shows why he is first amongst the clones and defends his good friend from the nasty birds. Eventually, the Jedi run into a colony of Lurmans, which are basically Irish lemurs. The Lurmans were a pacifist species. They originally hailed from the Outer Rim planet of Megiddo. The planet was taken over by the intergalactic banking clan, which basically enslaved all the locals. When the Clone Wars started, Megiddo joined the Confederacy, and soon violent battles broke out on their planet. The Lermans had only recently arrived to Meridun in order to escape all of the hostility happening on Megiddo. They were naturally dismayed to find Jedi and clone troopers rushing into their village, even though the Jedi seemed relatively peaceful and were only asking for some medical assistance. But the Lerman are kind people and sent a healer to go with Ahsoka and Commander Bly to go retrieve Anakin. Meanwhile, Ayala Secura and the Elder Lerman sit down and talk a bit about politics. Ayala explains to Lerman that the Jedi did not start the war and were for peace, while the Lerman responds by saying, What difference does it make who started the war and who only wants to end it? No side is free of fault. It takes two to fight. It's an interesting conversation because the Elder Lerman was both right and wrong. The Jedi were supposed to be peacekeepers and now have become military leaders. Two very different and contradictory roles. But it was because of their pacifism that the IGBC was able to exploit the Lerman in the first place and had driven them to the planet of Mary Dunn. And now things were about to get much worse. The Lerman would find out that the Republic weren't the only foreign power on this planet. Shortly after Ahsoka manages to bring Anakin back to the Lerman village for some rest and healing, a Separatist dropship lands nearby the village and Separatist commander Lok Durd quickly takes over the village for its protection. The Jedi and clones retreat into the wilderness and watch from a distance as battle droids began ransacking the village. See, Luck Durd was a very talented weapons designer and he was looking for a new place to run trials for his new bioweapon called a defoliator. It was basically the opposite of an ion weapon that the Republic routinely used against the droids. Instead of harming just machines, the defoliator only harmed organic beings. Well, actually it incinerated them. The defoliator was fired from a modified AAT hover tank, and the first trials against the local flora were extremely successful. But Lock Durd was a careful man and wanted to test the weapon against organic beings as well. The Lerman's little village was the perfect target. While pacifism is usually pretty great, it also involves a lot of running away from hostility. But in the Lerman's case, they had already been kicked off of Megiddo now on this relatively unknown world, they had been found again. At one point, you're gonna have to stay and fight. And that's exactly what the younger Lermans want, especially after witnessing the Separatist battle droids ransacking their village for no reason. And after scouting the Separatist weapons trial, the Jedi returned to the Lerman village in a stolen Separatist shuttle to warn the village that the Separatists were going to test their new weapon on them next. The Jedi being reasonable suggests removing the Lerman to a safer location, but the village elder is stubborn and won't abandon his home, but also won't fight either, leaving the Jedi with no choice but to defend the village all by themselves. They had managed to build some fortifications and activated some stolen shield generations in preparation for a Separatist assault. The younger Lerman again really wanted to fight, but... I'm sorry, but I cannot help. Many others agree with me, but we were raised under a very strict code. We must respect it, even if we don't agree. This kind of sounds like the same problem that Anakin and Ahsoka Tano are facing with the Jedi Order. Anyway, the Separatists launch their attack and the shields hold, forcing the droids to carry out a ground assault. They must take out the generator in order to test their new weapon. The three Jedi met the oncoming forces as Commander Bly and Captain Rex provided supporting fire. Although the Republic forces are initially successful, as the heavier battle droids advanced during the second wave along with hover tanks, the Republic had to fall back behind the shield and fortifications. 
and seconds later the droids spilled into the village and managed to destroy the shield generator, which allowed Lok Dur to launch another defoliator shell. Luckily, Anakin is able to disable the tank before it is able to fire. By this point, the Separatists have breached the perimeter and droids are running everywhere inside the village firing at innocent people. The Lerman have to fight back. Now, the Lerman weren't completely defenseless. They are quite agile and used to dealing with larger predators on the planet. The droids were also not really used to fighting such agile creatures, which gave the Lerman an upper hand. Eventually, the Lerman and the Republic forces were able to drive back the Separatist attack. Although initially hesitant to help the Jedi, the Republic forces were able to show the Lermans that they valued them. It's a similar principle to the hearts and mind approach that was used in the Vietnam War and Iraq and Afghanistan. General Stanley McChrystal, former commander of US and ISAF forces in Afghanistan, was a huge supporter of foreign internal defense and often cited the long-range reconnaissance patrol units used by American forces for great success in rural Vietnam. These LERP units, as they were called, would sometimes live in villages and during the day help farmers work the fields and build infrastructure, and at night the farmers would join the LERP forces in patrolling the area for Viet Cong. Now, these missions were highly successful, but they usually required specialized forces and they took a long time to set up. Ultimately, it was deemed to be too expensive to carry out on a larger scale. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.